Good afternoon, one and all. And it's one of the rare occasions when we have webinars on a topic back to back so that we can have a deeper look into that. And the fact that yesterday's webinar has already touched more than 10,000 views in a particular day, it creates history on the platform of Beyond Law CLC. We have not been able to touch 10,000 views in a on a Facebook page. And so we are so happy uh, that Justice N. Kumar, when he gave the insights on the topic of examination of witnesses, civil trial, and the Arbitration Act. And as, just, as yesterday, Justice N. Kumar, a former judge of Karnataka High Court and the president of Karnataka Judicial Academy, had taken us uh, what, according to him, was a bird eye view, but we felt that we were largely enriched by the way he took to the entire gamut of the uh, first part. And today, when we take examination of witnesses of civil trial and the Arbitration Act, as usual, he would first take us the manner, or uh, like yesterday, he apprised us that as to how the documents, etc., would be read into evidence, how they are marked, and how they are exhibited. What is the manner and what is the subtle differences between the under the civil trials as well as the Arbitration Act? Without taking much time, since uh, people know about Justice N. Kumar, who had connected yesterday on the Facebook as well on the platform. And even otherwise, he's such a popular person that everyone knows about him. I would request Justice N. Kumar of the yesterday, uh, from the yesterday's webinar on the topic. So kindly unmute yourself. Mute. Yes, sir. Right. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Yesterday, we saw how oral evidence is to be adduced. Today, let us see how documentary evidence is to be adduced in a civil trial. As all of you know, with the amendment to the Civil Procedure Code, all the documents on which the plaintiff relies on are to be filed along with the plaintiff. All the documents on which the defendant relies on are to be filed along with the written statement. They are permitted to file copies along with the pleadings. But once the pleadings are over, if the frame issues, Order 13 of the Civil Procedure Code expects the parties to produce all the original documents before the court. And if any document remains, that has to be filed along with the affidavit, which is filed by way of examination in chief. By that stage, all evidence is before the court. Thereafter, no document is permitted to be produced unless a special case is made out for production. Therefore, once the trial has begun, all the documents are on record. Now the party has filed an affidavit by way of examining chief. And in examination chief, expected to say is what he would have said by way of oral evidence. Now, as far as the documents are concerned, what is the mode in which you produce documents and you get it marked? That is, the documents are received by the court. Now, make it clear here, when we talk about examination in chief and oral evidence and documentary evidence, oral evidence, as I pointed out to you yesterday, the directive of what the witness has seen, what the witness has heard, what the witness has perceived, and if it is a specialized professional evidence, evidence of experts. All this is oral evidence. Now, there are cases where 
a particular issue is to be proved not only by oral evidence. Sometimes it can't be proved by oral evidence. It has to be proved by documentary evidence. For example, if a dispute to the title to the property is involved, any amount of oral evidence is not a substitute for documentary evidence. It is the documents of title which have to be proved. If a suit for specific performance based on agreement of sale, it is the agreement of sale which is to be produced. Likewise, documentary evidence is produced. But in the affidavit, what one should not do is this. Say, for example, a suit for specific performance based on an agree written agreement of sale. What the party can say by oral evidence is the defendant has agreed to sell the property to me under an agreement of sale, date as so and so, for a consideration of rupees so and so. But once the agreement is reduced into writing, the affidavit should not contain the terms of the contract. It is prohibited. Therefore, what they have to produce is the document itself. Therefore, the affidavit should say that agreement of sale is produced and it will be marked as Exhibit P1. And then that agreement is to be tendered in evidence to the court and you should take mark. You should not go on repeating the content of the affidavit. It is not permissible and such a thing should be. So therefore, when we have to produce documents in support of our case, the next question would be the proof of contents of documents. Section 61 of the Evidence Act categorically states the contents of a document may be proved either by primary or secondary. Oral evidence has to be direct. Documentary evidence should be by producing the primary evidence or by secondary evidence. What do you mean by a primary evidence? Section 62 defines the primary evidence means the document itself produced for the inspection of the court. If your case is based on a document, the law says you produce that document itself so that the court will look into the document and then comes to the conclusion to which it has to come. Now, if that primary evidence is not available, the law provides for what is known as secondary evidence. That is, secondary evidence means the certified copies under the provisions of the Evidence Act, copies of the original taken out in a mechanical process, we know what is also Xerox copies, counterparts of the documents, and Replica of the documents of the original. These are all called secondary evidence. The document itself, the original document itself is the primary evidence. If for any reason the original document is not available, then the same thing could be proved by producing secondary evidence, which is nothing but a replica of the original. Now this is about production of primary and secondary evidence. Now coming to the proof of documents by primary evidence. Section 64 of the Evidence Act says the document itself must be proved, that the document must be proved by primary evidence except in cases here and after mentioned. And then Section 65 speaks about how and when secondary evidence could be adduced. That is, when the original document is in the opposite party he refuses to produce. Original is lost. Original is destroyed. Original is not in the possession of the party who wants to rely on. If you make out a case for reason for not producing the primary evidence, the court will permit you to lead secondary evidence. There's a lot of confusion about this. How do you make out a case? A simple way of making out a case is the witness should enter the witness box, the party should enter the witness box, and he should state before the court on oath either the primary evidence is not in his possession, primary evidence is in the possession of the opposite party, he has called upon him by a notice to produce which he has not produced, if the original is lost, 
if the original is destroyed is called laying the foundation laying the foundation for producing the secondary evidence so with after laying the foundation saying why the document cannot be produced then in law he is permitted to produce what is known as the secondary evidence and it is acceptable so this is a procedure which is followed in almost all courts proof of the document as i said the document itself is a proof and once the document is before the court the court will be in a position to look into the documents now the question is documents are produced along with the pleadings it is in record it doesn't form part of evidence the party may produce it to court on a second thought he may not rely on that evidence at all therefore he will not tender that document in evidence so production into court is the first stage then through the witness that document is to be tendered in evidence when the document is tendered in evidence then the opposite party will have a right to object to the production that is receipt of the document by the court Ob that is regarding objection regarding marking if there is no objection the document is marked the document is marked means that is a ministerial act it is a ministerial act but before the document is marked the court has to apply consciously it is judicial mind and receive the document and then mark and merely because a document is marked it does not mean the document is proved after the document is marked if the document is in dispute then the party who is marking the document has to lead evidence to prove the contents of the document this is the procedure production entering the document in evidence marking of the document and then proof of document back to the choice this is a part and parcel of the civil procedure code order 13 rule 3 Categorically states rejection of irrelevant and inadmissible documents. The court may at any stage of the suit may reject any document which it considers irrelevant or otherwise inadmissible, recording the grounds of such rejection. Therefore, the court has the power to reject the document which are tendered in evidence. If the document is not rejected in that fashion. what is it the court is expected to do when do you say the document is received in evidence rule 4 provides there shall be endorsed on every document which has been admitted in evidence in the suit the following particulars namely the number and title of the suit the name of the person producing the document the date on which it was produced and a statement of its having been so admitted and the endorsement will be signed and initial by the judge normally there will be a stamp which contains all these particulars it is the bench clerk who but it is the judge who consciously applies his judicial mind and affixes signature and then only it can be said the document is admitted in evidence so therefore this marking of a document and admitting the document in evidence is a very crucial aspect in a civil trial only if the document is admitted in evidence then the court can look into the document otherwise it cannot the civil procedure code also says when a document is produced if the other side raises an objection regarding marking of the document on the ground that it is insufficiently stamped 
the court has to apply its mind then and there and find out whether the document is sufficiently stamped or not if the document is not sufficiently stamped on a 13 rule 8 of the civil procedure court provides that the court has to impound the document court has to impound the document now as far as impounding of documents are concerned they are exhaustively dealt with under the stamp act we will come to that little later so therefore one should be very clear merely by producing the document to court it has not become evidence it does not become a part of the record only when you want to rely on the document the document is to be tendered in evidence it should be admitted in evidence in proof of admission it is marked in evidence and thereafter is the document in dispute the party has to adduce evidence in proof of the document that's where the again the oral evidence in respect of documentary evidence comes in now that is where the witnesses play a big role even in proof of a document though the document itself is produced if the document is disputed that document is proved by oral evidence how do you prove oral evidence document and who are the type of witnesses who are normally examined in civil trial now the first type of witnesses who are examined in the case is the party themselves we saw yesterday parties have to step into the witness box first and give evidence and through them the documents are marked even though the document is marked he may not be the competent witness to prove the document therefore to prove the document the parties may examine witnesses in the witnesses we have two types of witnesses private witnesses and official witnesses in so far as private witnesses who speak about the documents are concerned are persons who are present at the time of execution of the document persons who have affixed the signature as witnesses of the document persons in fact who has written the document author of the document so they are all persons who are examined when the document is disputed to prove the case of the plaintiff if the person was present at the time of document he will step into the witness box and say i saw with my eyes the document was written in my presence after the document was written it was read over after it was read over the executant signed it witness has signed it there is another mode of proving the document if the document has witnesses those witnesses are examined who will also come before the court and say i was present at the time of writing of the document so and so gave instructions so and so wrote the document then the executant signed it and then we have signed it that is oral evidence in proof of documentary evidence here one distinction has to be noted every document doesn't require attestation but there are documents which are compulsorily attestable what are those number 1 will is a document which requires compulsory attestation mortgage deed is a document which requires compulsory attestation gift deed is a document which requires attestation now if a document requires attestation and if the document is disputed section 68 of the evidence act says you must examine one attesting witness at least who is alive in proof of the due execution of that document what do you mean by attested it is defined in the uh, transfer of property act and also well as hindu succession act indian succession act with reference to wills now when you need evidence regarding attestation it is not that the person enters the witness box and says i saw them executing the document attestation has a particular connotation in the eye of law what is that only when you know that then you can lead evidence in support of that attestation and attesting witness what that he should speak is very important attestation means the document is written the executant fully being conscious and aware of the contents signs the document so he is the executant if it is a will he is the testator if it is a gift he is the donor if it is a mortgage he is the mortgage owner he has fixed the signature when they say this requires attestation the attesting witness should say 
if he was present at the time of execution, he should say, I saw the executant sign the document. The definition of attestation shows executant may sign or he may put a mark or if he is not capable of putting a mark or a sign, he may authorize somebody to sign on his behalf. Therefore, that is execution. And the attesting witness should identify the signature. It is not the law that the attesting witness should be present when the executant signs the document. If he is present, well and good. If he is not present, attestation means the executant should tell the attesting witness that it is his signature, it is his mark, he has got somebody sign it. After the executant tells the attesting witness, then in proof of execution, he signs the document. Though the presence of the attesting witness is not necessary when the document is executed, the presence of the executant is a must when the attesting witness attests the document. Attestation means two witnesses should attest the document. It is not the law that both the witnesses, attesting witness should be present at that time. But both should have acknowledgement from the executant that it is his signature. If he was not present at the time of execution, and if he was present at the execution, he can say, in my presence it is done. So when you are filing an affidavit by way of examination in chief, you must bear in mind the requirements of attestation. He's merely coming to the witness box and saying, I have signed this, is not proof of attestation. And if such evidence is given, in the end of the day of appreciation evidence, the court may say, even though an attesting witness is executed, attestation is not true. Insofar as wills are concerned, section 68 is very clear. There is nothing like a declaration by the court that the will is proved by consent, by default. An attesting witness, one attesting witness should be compulsorily examined to prove the attestation of a will. Otherwise, will is not. So when you are preparing an affidavit, though you have produced a document, if the document is in dispute, that disputed document, execution and attestation is to be proved by one evidence. So knowing clearly the law on the body, what are the requirements which will constitute due execution, due attestation, that evidence should be set out in the affidavit file in support of the examination chief. Otherwise, though the document is there, though the attesting witness is examined, his evidence will be of no consequence. So therefore, this attesting witness, they form a class by themselves. If they have to be examined, these aspects have to be kept in mind and their evidence should be led in that fashion. Then we have the expert's evidence. If the case involves some technical aspects, engineering aspects, medical aspects, we examine experts in the field. They are not ordinary witnesses. They are coming and because of their learning, they are assisting the court and they are giving evidence. Of course, they are cross-examined. So they are called as experts. Then there is another type of experts. That is, handwriting is disputed. LTM is disputed. Then it is sent for scientific investigation. A commission is appointed. Expert in the field is appointed. He gives evidence. That called his commissioner's report. If the parties agree to the commission's report, automatically it becomes a part of the record and it becomes evidence. But if any of the party has a grievance, he does not accept them. Then what he is expected to do is, he should call upon that party to enter the witness box and he has a right to cross-examine. There is an examination in chief of an expert because his report is the examination in chief. Any person who is agreed by or who doesn't agree what he has said, he can enter as the witness to enter the witness box and he can be examined exhaustively. That about, though it is a court appointed the commissioner, he is an expert in the field, the law is well settled. The expert's evidence is not conclusive. The court, for a good reason, may not act on that. But in normal circumstances, as the court 
doesn't have the expertise. It gives due weight to the evidence of these experts, and they are called as experts, and also the persons who are appointed as commissioners who come and give evidence. Then we have another type of evidence. We summon government officials who are in possession of government documents to produce document and to give evidence. They are not strictly speaking the witnesses of anybody. They are all government officials. In discharge of their functions, they have performed certain acts. In the course of that performance of their duties, certain documents have come into existence. And the other side disputes it. And therefore, it is open to the parties to summon them to produce those government documents and also give evidence in support of the case. They are called as official witnesses. And when a document is in the handwritten or when it is typed and it is disputed, normally the person who signed the document, who has written the document, who has typed the document, who may, we call it as scribe, he is also examined to prove the authenticity of the document. Therefore, in witnesses, party himself is a witness, attesting witnesses to a document or witnesses. In cases where document is compulsorily attestable, those attesting witnesses are a necessary witnesses to be examined in the case. Technical matters, scientific matters, in medical jurisprudence, you examine experts in the field, they are called experts. And when the court appoints commissioners for investigation and submitting a report, they are also in a way experts. They come and give evidence. And when officials are summoned to produce documents and evidence, they are called as official witnesses. And when the document is in writing, type, the persons who prepared the document, they are also summoned to examine witnesses. Like this, among the witnesses, we have several categories. So the question is, is that evidence relevant to prove the case? Is that evidence relevant to prove the document which is in this law. And it is an appreciation of the evidence. The court will come to the conclusion one way or the other. Earlier, if the party is unable to get a witness, the law provides for taking out summons and he will, he will come and then he is examined. Now, amendment has been affected to effect. If a party is willing to come and give evidence, even without even without summons, he can be summoned. But unfortunately, when a person comes without a summons, much of the time is wasted in his cross-examination. Was there any summons? Why did you come? At whose distance you have come? He has won over you. See, all this doesn't know. Now the law says, if you want to examine a witness, if that witness is willing to come, get him. If the witness is not willing to come, except to the process of court, take out summons from the court, and examine him. So in the end of the day, it doesn't make any difference. Ultimately, what he has said, whether he has withstood the test of cross-examination is the criteria, and not whether he has come on his own or whether he has come through the court process. So therefore, witnesses are of several types, and each one has a particular role to play in a civil court, civil trial, and certainly it is the ultimately the court which will weigh their evidence and come to the conclusion one way or other whether that case is true or not true. Now, this is the examination of witnesses to prove the documents. Now, I said when the document is sought to be produced, the opposite party has a right to object. Now, earlier, the law was Whenever an objection is taken to the marking of the document, admissible to the document, the court has to decide it then and there itself, and you should pass, pass a considered order. When such orders were passed, that was challenged in the higher court. And if the court grants a stay, the entire trial came to a stand. That was the reason for delay in disposal of cases. And so far as the parliament is concerned, they amended extensively section 115 of the Civil Procedure Court, making the scope of revision of these orders to the minimum. But the more important thing is, Supreme Court in the year 2000, 
taking note of the condition in which these things happened in our country has passed the law. I would say it is a judgment rendered by the court under Article 141, which is the law of the land, which is holding fee. What they said was, when an admissible, when a document is disputed, the document is to be marked subject to objection, and an objection is to be heard along with the case on merits. They don't need to pass any order. Mark it, subject to objection. Person who is objecting can always point out in the course of argument that document should be relied upon. Therefore, this obstruction to the course of trial was taken. But it was with two exceptions. The two exceptions are, one, objection regarding stamp duty. Objection regarding registration. They said, these two issues are concerned. That must be decided then and then itself. The reason is, as far as stamp duty is concerned, that one of the major source of income for the exchequer. You cannot go on marking documents and postpone the collection of tax. Therefore, every state act for what should be done when a document which is to be charged to duty is not charged. In fact, the state acts define what you mean by chargeable, what you mean by duly stamped, what you mean by instrument. So an instrument should be duly stamped. That is, it is charged to that document. So if a document is not properly stamped, what is the procedure to be followed? Throughout the country, the law is the same. Though each state has a stamp act, the provisions are in parameter of each other. Now, for example, take our Karnataka Stamp Act, which deals with Section 33. It deals with what is known as examination and impounding of instruments. What they say is, every person having by law or consent of parties to receive evidence. Court is an authority which is empowered to receive evidence. If such a document is produced before him, and if that instrument is chargeable in his opinion with the duty, and if it is produced or comes in the performance of his function, shall, if it appears to him that the instrument is not duly stamped, impound the same. Impound the same. Therefore, a statutory duty is cast on a civil court to impound a document which is produced before it as evidence, if that document is not duly stamped, there is no concession, there is no exception. Whether the opposite party raises objection or not, the duty is on the court to look into the document, find out whether the document is duly stamped or not, and if it is not duly stamped, impound the document, and a duty is cast upon the court to collect duty and 10 times penalty. So it is a statute conferred on court. Now, the aspect which requires the state is if a lawyer is not present, then the document is tendered in evidence, opposite lawyer. Court is not diligent. But Therefore, an insufficiently document, stamp document, is marked in evidence. What would be the effect? The effect of such a thing is no instrument chargeable with duty shall be admitted in evidence for any purpose, by any person, having by law or consent of parties authority to this evidence, and shall be acted upon, registered, authenticated by any such person. So if the document is not duly stamped, it is a scrap of paper. It has no value. It is no evidence at all. But somehow the document is marked unintentionally without properly applying its mind. Then the section says, once the document is marked, which is insufficiently stamped, then Objection to the marking cannot be taken up in that proceedings 
or even in the proceedings like appeal, second appeal or revision. That is, where an instrument has been admitted in evidence, such admission shall not be called in question at any stage of the same suit or proceeding on the ground that the instrument has not duly stand. And this is a law declared by the Supreme Court also. But that doesn't mean that the court cannot import the document and recover the stamp duty. So therefore, in a civil trial, where documentary evidence is relied upon, the advocates on the opposite side should be very careful. They should not be absent when the documents are produced in evidence. Even the court should be careful. Otherwise, a valuable right of a defendant may be seriously hampered if documents which are insufficiently stamped or admitted in evidence, thereby valuable rights of the defendants are taken away. Now, once the document is insufficiently stamped, it is standard evidence, and the court impounds the document, the law provides for payment of the deficient stamp duty and 10 times the penalty. If the party tendering the evidence produces the stamp duty and also produces a penalty, then a document which was initially inadmissible becomes admissible. And once the stamp duty is paid, penalty is paid, the court is expected to look into the document and decide the rights of the parties. So therefore, there is no bar for the court to look into the said document. Similarly, objection regarding registration. That is contained in section 49 of the Registration Act. No document required by section 17 of the Registration Act will be, if it is not registered, will affect any immobile property comprised therein or received as evidence of any transaction affecting such property or conferring such power unless it has been registered. So this is an objection again to be taken at the time of marking of the document. The only difference between the stamp objection and registration objection is even if a document which compulsory requires to be registered is admitted in evidence, though not registered, because of the operation of law, it makes no difference. Unless the document is registered, there is no transfer of interest in the property. That document has no value. That cannot be looked into. But the proviso to that provision says, but the document can be looked into for what is known as collateral purposes. This is the subject matter of a lot of judgments in civil trials. What do you mean by a collateral purpose? Collateral purpose means if the purpose for which you are looking into the document, if the law does not require it to be registered, then you can look into it. Take, for example, a partition. Under Indian law, a partition can be warranted. It need not be in writing. However, a partition is reduced into writing, but not duly stamped, not registered. Then objected to. Objected to on the ground that it is not registered. Even the document can be marked, but the terms of the document cannot be gone into. The collateral purpose for which it can be looked into is, as law does not require a partition should be in writing, it may be a proof of partition in the family, but what property fell to which share cannot be looked into under the document. So therefore, the difference between the Stamp Act and the Registration Act is under the Stamp Act, the document cannot be looked into unless duty and penalty is paid. Insofar as registration is cancelled, even if an unregistered document is registered, no interest passes, but it can be looked into for collateral purposes. So this is the difference which one should keep in mind when we are talking about documents, production of documents, and proof of documents. Therefore, mere marking of a document is not proof of document, 
you have to prove the document to be disputed by examining witnesses who are well acquainted with the facts of the case and as i said the purpose for which that person is examined now the question is this is what happens in the civil court what is the procedure in so far as arbitration cases are concerned because section 19 of the arbitration act says the arbitral tribunal shall not be bound by the code of civil procedure or the indian evidence act what is the effect is there any different procedure provided under the arbitration act for production of documents for examination of witnesses is the question now i would say this is the language of the arbitration act it says arbitral tribunal shall not be bound the sort if the arbitral tribunal want to follow the civil procedure code there is no provision if the arbitral tribunal want to ignore it nobody can find fault with this having said that this is very important the power of the arbitral tribunal under subsection 3 that is first the party is given the right to choose the procedure to be followed in trial under the arbitration act section 192 if the parties do not agree to a particular procedure the arbitral tribunal can decide the procedure once the tri arbitral tribunal decides the procedure it may follow the civil procedure code or it may decide to follow its own procedure subsection 4 of section 19 makes it very clear whatever may be the procedure the tribunal is going to follow during trial the power of the arbitral tribunal under subsection 3 includes the power to determine the admissibility relevancy or materiality and weight of any as i could see i do not find any law which is better than the evidence act about which we are all very familiar therefore arbitral tribunals do rely on substantially the provisions of the evidence act even in a trial before an arbitral tribunal if a document which is insufficiently stamped is sought to be produced and if the opposite party objects the tribunal is bound to apply its mind and find out whether the document is duly stamped or not because stamp act says any authority court public authority any authority which includes an arbitration court is bound to apply its mind and find out whether the document is sufficiently stamped or not and if it is not stamped follow the procedure prescribed under the stamp act similarly if a document requires registration and it is not registered certainly the substance of the provisions of the registration act are reflected and the arbitral tribunal is bound to look into these aspects so therefore i do not find any marked difference between the production of documents decision regarding admissibility marking on rejection of documents both in the arbitral cases and in the civil court the procedure followed is one and the same now as for the witnesses are concerned there is some difference as i said in the civil court exam in chief is by way of a affidavit and cross examination is done in the case of appealable cases the answer given by the witness is taken as it is in the case of non appealable cases the court can summarize the evidence and record it. in arbitration cases what exactly happens is the parties agree the evidence in chief is filed by an affidavit there's no difference in so far as cross examination is concerned they say it is an international case question is taken and answer is taken question is taken and answer is taken unless the party say let us record the evidence in the way it is recorded in court otherwise normally in arbitration proceedings the advocate puts a question in cross 
examination. Question is taken. The witness gives an answer that is taken. That is the mode in which evidence is recorded in arbitration cases. Yet another factor which makes a difference between arbitral tribunal and the civil court is in the civil court, the judge who is presiding over that particular court is not an expert in any field except the law. If any questions involving technical knowledge, engineering, medicine is involved, normally a commission is appointed, his report is sought for, and then the court looks into the report and decides the case. But in the case of arbitration, if any technical aspects are involved, Engineering is involved, medicine is involved, accountancy is involved. In the constitution of the arbitral tribunal itself, you can have an expert, normally in building contracts. There will be two arbitrators appointed by the parties who are engineers or architects or experts in the field. And the presiding arbitrator would be a judge. So that the presiding arbitrator takes care of legal matters. The two experts in the field looks into the technical aspects or scientific aspects. And all of them should be able to produce a reasonably good award. That is lacking in the civil court. Civil courts have to depend upon experts by appointing them as commissioners act on the report or to give the opportunity to the parties to cross-examine them. In tribunal, the difference is you can have experts themselves on the tribunal. They become part of the tribunal and they would be in a better position. Appreciate these scientific matters, technical matters, uh, and decide these disputes in a satisfactory manner. That's the difference between a civil court trial and a difference in the uh, arbitration proceedings. Now, as far as the proof of documents is concerned, the law is the same. I do not see any difference because that is the most important aspect. If a document is approved in a manner known to law, even though it need not be too technical, in substance, the document is to be proved in a manner known to law. And without the proof of document, the, no party can say, I have proved my case. So therefore, though, the arbitral tribunal has the freedom to ignore the civil procedure code, ignore the provisions of the Evidence Act. In some and substance, they do follow these procedures. Maybe some technical aspects here and there, they may be ignored. But otherwise, the difference is the same. Even as far as exams and witnesses are concerned, in arbitration cases, affidavits are filed at length, and again, they are subject to cross-examination. And I told you the way in which the evidence is recorded. And ultimately, by looking into work, world and government evidence, the case is decided by the learned arbitrators. There is not have much difference in that. Now, another aspect which requires careful consideration is, why are we constituting commercial courts? Why are we parties now preferring alternative dispute resolution mechanisms? The one and the only reason given was there is an inordinate delay in disposal of cases in the civil court. So then what is the procedure prescribed in the civil court, which is different from the Arbitration Act as well as the Commercial Courts Act? Here, I am sorry to say, though steps were taken by the parliament as far back as in the year 1976 by amending Order 17 of the Civil Procedure Code, but no effort is made to give effect to the said provisions. I take this opportunity to bring it to the notice of the members of the bar, what the law is, and then you decide for yourself what actually transpires in court. And for no fault of the CPC, CPC is blamed for delay in disposal of cases. Order 17 Rule 1 speaks about granting adjournments. Everybody reads only that provision. They don't look into the other provisions at all. The court may, if sufficient cause is shown at any stage of the suit, 
grant time to the parties to any of them and may from time to time adjourn the hearing of the suit for reasons to be recorded in writing the word for reasons to be recorded in writing was not there earlier now it is introduced making it obligatory for the court to give reasons why he is adjourning the case but invariably in most of the cases no reasons are given and but they say by amendment no such adjournment should be granted more than three times to a party during hearing of the suit so each party is entitled to only three adjournment and what is more important is today the court in every such case where the case is adjourned the court shall fix a day for the further hearing of the suit and shall make such order as to cause occasion by the adjournment or such higher cost as the court deems fit there cannot be an adjournment without imposing cost but invariably in courts adjournments are granted without cost and then the very purpose of these amendments are frustrated now that is more important is there is a proviso added in 1976 about how a civil trial should go on in a civil court now let us see how the law says civil trial should take place in a civil court then we will compare it with arbitration act then we will compare it with the recent commercial court act and find out which is better which is faster the proviso to order 1701 categorically states when the hearing of the suit has commenced that is issues are framed witness is put in the witness box when the hearing of the suit has commenced it shall be continued from day to day it shall be continued from day to day until all the witnesses in attendance have been examined all the witnesses in attendance have been examined unless the court finds for exceptional reasons to be recorded by it the adjournment of the hearing beyond the following day is necessary so what does it mean once the case is ready for trial plaintiff has entered the witness box he should be ready with the witnesses and the evidence should go on day to day if the evidence is not over on the day it should be conducted on the next day but for some reason if you are not able to take up the case next day and if it is to be taken up day after next day court has to give reasons why it has been done there is no question of adjourning beyond a week even if you want to adjourn beyond 24 hours there should be an exceptional case and the court should give reasons this is what is expected of a civil court by way of the 76 amendment they did not stop there no adjournment shall be granted at the request of a party except where the circumstances are beyond the control of that party only when the circumstances are beyond the control of the party adjournment is to be granted otherwise no adjournment and the most important thing is this the fact that the pleader of a party is engaged in another court shall not be a ground for adjournment shall not be a ground for adjournment it is in statute book from 1976 now today what's happening in the trial courts each senior lawyer has got half a dozen juniors for what purpose only to go and submit to the court that his senior is engaged in another court and he wants time a procedure which is completely prohibited as civil procedure code please see the language used the fact that the pleader of a party is engaged in another court shall not be a ground for adjournment in spite of this mandate of law even today in courts cases are adjourned on the ground that the senior is held up in another court then where the illness of a pleader or is liable to conduct the case for any reason other than is being engaged in another court is put forward as a ground for adjournment the court shall not grant the adjournment unless it is satisfied that the party applying for adjournment could not have engaged another pleader in time that means the illness if it is sudden party is not able to make alternative arrangements then a case for adjournment is put off but if the party has sufficient time to make alternative adjournment on the ground that the counsel is not well and 
for any reason is unable to come to court, then that is not a ground for it. So a stringent provisions are introduced under Order 17 for adjournment of the cases. Even the illness of a counsel is not a party. The party for counsel has other work is not a ground for a party. And this rule is followed only in breach. Further, they go to the extent of saying, where a witness is present in court, but a party or a speeder is not present, or the party or a speeder, though present in court, is not ready to examine or cross-examine the witness, the court may, if it thinks fit, record the statement of the witness and pass such orders as it thinks fit, dispensing with the examining chief or cross-examining the witness, as the case may be, by the party or his pleader not present or not ready as aforesaid. So therefore, court has been given power. Sometimes it so happens, witness is present. You'll be telling my lawyer will come, the party will come. Court says, the law says, don't wait for them. Put him in the witness box, examine him, leave him. So the whole object was to ensure a speedy trial. Once the evidence has commenced, it should end with the judgment in the case. There should not be adjournments for months and years, which happens to me. This is what is contained in the Civil Procedure Code, as far as regular courts are concerned. So, in 1996, we got the Arbitration Act. Arbitration Act did not speak about this. Now, in the 2015 amendment, a provision is introduced in the Arbitration Act virtually copying this provision from the Civil Procedure Court. Now it says, the arbitral tribunal shall, as far as possible, hold oral hearings for the presentation of evidence or for oral argument on a day-to-day -day basis and not grant an adjournment unless sufficient cause is made out and may impose costs, including exemplary costs, the party seeking adjournment without any sufficient cause. So this provision in the Civil Procedure Court finds now a place in the Arbitration Act by way of 2015 amendment. So day-to-day -day trial is the order. Only in exceptional cases, adjournment could be given. If adjournment is given, cost is to be imposed and the trial should go on day-to-day -day basis. Now coming to the Commercial court side, we have another extreme proposition. After the pleadings are complete, documents are produced, interrogatories are over, documents are admitted and disputed, affidavits are filed, issues are framed, the case is posted for trial. The case is posted for a day on which day the court man is called a court management hearing. On that day, the court has to stop the trial. On what date evidence affidavits has to be filed? On what date cross examination to be done? On what day written argument is to be filed? On what day oral argument is to be done? And the law clearly says from the date of the case management hearing, the conclusion of the trial and argument should be within six months. It can't be beyond six months. This is what today we have by way of 2015 amendment to the CPC insofar as commercial courts are concerned. So virtually the way the trial is to be conducted, whether it is a civil court, whether it is a commercial court, whether it is an arbitration court, is one and the same. The emphasis is on speedy disposal of cases. Emphasis on day-to-day -day trial. Emphasis is to disregard these adjournments. And if adjournments are sought, so that the opposite party, who is inconvenienced by the adjournment, is duly compensated. This is the sum and substance of the procedural law insofar as civil trial is concerned. Whether it is in court, it is not in commercial courts. That's where we stand today. So, <clears throat> with this background, 
whatever the lawmakers can do, according to me, they have done it. If you are not able to follow this procedure prescribed, are we admitting that we are incapable of doing it? Or is it a case of not changing your mental attitude? In my view, we are capable, but we are yet to readjust our priorities and there is difficulty. The day the lawyers change their mental attitudes, the day judges their attitudes, the law which is in India is more than sufficient for speedy disposal of cases and our law, procedural law, is in no way is in no way inferior to any other law in any other jurisdiction. It is our inability to implement this in letter and spirit, which has given an impression as though the Indian legal system do not provide for a speedy disposal of cases. My appeal to the members of the legal fraternity is now lawyers are a part of assisting the country in the economic growth. India is trying to become an economic superpower. Now it is well recognized. A strong, sound judicial system is a sign for non for economic growth. And it is here today, the judges and the lawyers have a role to play, not only in the judicial administration, but also in the economic growth of the country. I will stop here and let me have some questions so that doubts can be clarified. Yes, sir. <clears throat> As usual, the words cannot express the way you have hammered the point in the right perspective. Uh, this is by Anuba. He, uh, it is, in commercial suit, the contract is not stamped at all. Most clauses and agreements are in email. Can the petitioner still mark the photocopy of the contract? The question is, when you are marking the e e documents which are received by email, now it is well understood. Section 65B makes it very clear. An affidavit is sufficient to say, this is what I have received in email, and it becomes admissible in evidence. But if it requires to be stamped, it has to be stamped. But for stamping, all other documents that are received by email could be marked in evidence by just filing an affidavit under Section 65B of the Evidence Act. Okay. And this is by Radesha Morya. How collateral purpose documents are used in the case of unregistered instruments? Yes, that's what I told you. Unless the document is registered, there is no transfer of interest in the property. If transfer of interest is the subject matter of the suit, by producing an unregistered document, one cannot succeed. But the document can be used for collateral purposes, means the purposes for which, if a document has come into existence and it does not require registration, it could be looked into. That's why I gave you an example of partition. Now, for example, today, Section 17, 1 capital A is introduced in the Registration Act, making it compulsory for registration of an agreement of sale for the purpose of Section 53, capital A. If the document is not registered, that document cannot be used for the purpose of 53A, but the document can be used for the purpose of finding out whether there was a contract for sale or not. So to find out whether it's contract for sale, it is a collateral purpose. If you want benefit under 53A, it requires this. Because an agreement of sale need not be in writing under law. It can be oral also. Yes. This is by uh, standard clause. Both plaintiffs' counsel and defendant counsels uh, did not appear in the court, but the plaintiffs appeared in the court. Whether the judge can object the plaintiff not to come to the court without the lawyer and warn the plaintiff. It all depends upon how you want this. Normally, when a party has engaged a counsel, he should speak through his counsel. Both the party and lawyer both can't do it. 
But when the advocate is not there, only party is there. If he is decent, no judge will say. If he is mischievous, to get rid of him, they say, go and get him a lawyer. There is nothing like a law. It's all how a court manages its court. Uh, this is by Sri Kanteshwar. Is it necessary for the plaintiff to enter the witness box and get the documents marked as exhibits in a partition suit with the plaintiffs when the defendants have admitted the plead, uh, the pleadings in view of order 12? That's what I said. After the pleadings are completed, issues are framed. Either all the issues, the burden of proof may be on the plaintiff. Or some of the issues on the plaintiff, some of the issues on the defendant. If the defendant admits the case of the plaintiff and pleads discharge, then there is no necessity for the plaintiff to enter the witness box. If the defendant fails to prove his defense, suit is to be decreed. Therefore, the right to begin in such cases is on the defendant. Order 18, Rule 1 is very clear. Right to begin. Normally on the plaintiff, when the defendant has admitted the case, and he has set up a particular defense to defeat the right of the plaintiff. The right to begin is on the defendant. He can enter the witness box. Zad Singh, uh, how can we exhibit an electronic evidence in evidence when original copy of such document is lost? That's what I said. Success, now everything is revolves around 65B and the cross-examination of that. Original, if it is not with you, the law says secondary evidence. And all this evidence, ultimately, the court has to apply its mind and as I say, it accepts it or not. You are only at the stage of production and proof. What best you can do, you can do it and left. ultimately the court will decide whether that particular fact is proved or not. <clears throat> Madhuri, if a document is wrongly exhibited, then there is no provision of de-exhibiting CPC. So what can be done in such a case? If a document is wrongly admitted, which requires stamp duty. Exhibited, that, exhibited. That's correct. Document is exhibited. But the document is not duly stamped. In the same proceedings or in the higher proceedings, that objection cannot be taken. If it is not a question of stamp duty, some other thing, a wrongly document, the court will ignore it. That's all. The court has the power to reject at any point of time or Normally, what they do is they will not act upon the law. Uh, Dharamraj, due to non-appearance of plaintiff and his counsel, court has passed a dismissal order. In such case, what further steps should be taken? Normal dismissal order, dismiss for default order is passed. Order 9, rule 9 provides for filing an application for setting aside the order of dismissal and restoring the suit by showing sufficient cause for non-appearance of the party and the counsel on the day the case was dismissed by default. But a separate suit is not maintainable. He has to file an application and get it restored. This is Manju. Can the court allow the alleged will to be marked by the subscribe? Though attesting witnesses are alive, what is the validity of the will marked? Production of a will, anybody can do. Normally, the proponent of the will has to produce the will. Neither the evidence of the proponent nor the evidence of the scribe is proof of will. Section 68 of the Evidence Act is very clear. If a document requires to be attested, and attested, if the document is not disputed, except the will, you can produce a certified copy and go ahead. But in the case of will, original will is to be produced, and one attesting witness must be examined. Any amount of evidence from other sources is of no use. If no attesting witness is examined, will is not true. Thank you, sir. We don't have any other uh, questions. And as usual, uh, today also the session is doing extremely well on the Facebook. And we are all on behalf of the participants of Beyond, on the panel of Beyond Law PL, uh, CLC, as well as on the Facebook. We are quite thankful for giving us the insights in the three different sessions. A lot of doubts which were there in the mind of our participant stands dispelled. And those who were actually hearing it for the first time, I would not say it was a doubt. It was insightful session for all, for all of them. Uh, on behalf of all the participants, we are thankful.
and tomorrow's session would be taking you that since you were in the judicial academy we took another person as they say in a uh, relay race you give the baton from one uh, director to the another tomorrow we will have the chairman from the delhi judicial academy you must be knowing him professor dr bt call a former chairman of the delhi judicial academy culpable homicide and a murder a birds eye view so do stay connected with us tomorrow though the time is would be 5 pm everyone stay safe stay blessed and thank you sir and jai hind to all the participants stay safe and stay home thank you thank you thank you for the opportunity thank you